Hello, I am Jane Mudgett and welcome to Coach to Coach C to C. I am a coach and author and a presenter and welcome to our Women's History Month edition of C to C. Today I have one of my international friends joining us and she is a delight. Carola Sokolnik is a presenter, is an author, is a culture manager, is a former actress, and she is also an executive leadership coach, which is where she spends probably an awful lot of her time. So welcome, Carola. Thank you for inviting me, Jane. Carola is joining us from Austria, and we are part of a global women's group where we get lots of new perspectives from all around the world. Today, we are not going to talk about that per se, but we're going to talk about this continuum that we often often experience, which is between fear and courage. And they're, they're the same coin, but two different sides. And often we just move into that fear zone and forget the courage that we have from within. So maybe Carola, you can tell me first how you got started in this area of courage and does it have to do with your book? <laughs> yeah, well, it has to do with my book. Okay. And um, what is so interesting is, you know, when you said what, what, what I'm doing and that has a, a history. And so this history includes that I had to kind of reinvent myself quite a bit. Sometimes from the outside, sometimes just from the inside of um, yeah, an illness that forced me to stop my, my, my stage career and so on. And whenever you do that, you need to have a lot of courage. But of course, you're also facing fear. Right. And then I, <laughs> then I said, OK, I'm writing a book. And what is it? And because I love us human beings a lot, and I really think we have so much potential, um, I, I also plead that we should develop more our inner potential, our intuition, and so on. I said, yes, but also this, if you're in business and so you're talking about intuition, you're talking about spirituality, some people get pushed in a corner and they said, but that's not the point. Because if you can apply all of our potential on one hand you become a wonderful leader on the other hand you have to be quite courageous mm. to put it on the plate what you're doing and this is where i come from mm -hmm. and yes there's fear sometimes because if you do it for the first time that you said oh you know i i don't use my excel sheets to decide or my my surveys or something but i trust my guts you just mm. not only do it, but you also speak about it. That's sometimes connected to a bit of fear. Yeah, that that reminds me of that sort of continuum of analysis paralysis versus, versus trusting our gut and intuition. And there's an old movie, and I don't know if you've seen it, the original Indiana Jones, where he has to make this step across this abyss this valley and he says oh my gosh it's it's a leap of faith i have to be have faith that it's going to work out and sometimes that makes me think about that intuition and that gut so if we find ourselves having those fearful experiences a lot how do we go about improving that about ourselves carola what did you find in, in your research well, I have two words I put together with the with the courage, which is trust and confidence. Mm. And those two, one thing is trusting, but not a naive trusting, but a kind of a, a approved and an assured trusting. So of mm -hmm. course you need to look out if it's dangerous. But most of the dangers we face are not as as dangerous as we think they are. So we can trust that we will survive because. 99% is not about survival nowadays. And the confidence that I can trust myself that on one hand, I learned enough already, but I'm also open enough to listen, to watch and to see what could be dangerous and to learn from that or to develop new things from that. That's my potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about listening to myself, not listening too much to the fear but hearing it, making it an ally, because the fear is perfect to show us the way. And the fear knows where it could be potentially dangerous. 
but sometimes you just need it, need need to 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 put the fear in the drawer and say, you know, you stay there for one hour. I check the rest. I listen to myself, and then you can come out again, and then we two have a discussion. Ah, you're putting it you're putting it aside for a moment. So, yeah. what you're challenging me to do is say to myself, "What if I didn't have fear?" Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put that fear in the drawer. I that that I can relate to 100. percent And it also makes me think about how do I quantify the danger? You know that if I did this particular action or decision or made this comment, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to me? And it's usually not death, it's embarrassment, it's frustration, it's having my dignity challenged a little bit. Um, but it, it's, do you find that it's, lot, it's a lot less harmful than most people originally perceive? yes it's yeah it is okay it's just you know embarrassment feels like dying yeah and the thing there it is so big being humiliated feels like you lose your face literally and i think we have to acknowledge that that death is one threat but the others are somehow tied to our dignity and if dignity is compromised, it's not good. It, it, it does not work. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we, where we really have to look at, kind of educate, develop ourselves to become stronger, stronger on that and realizing, okay, the dignity I'm losing is mostly the dignity that I'm losing in front of myself. Mm -hmm. Because I stop giving myself the dignity. And of course, we need outside people and we need feedback from the outside. So if, if, feed, if dignity is taken away from the outside, that's impossible to live with on a certain level. But you can learn it. And it does not cost your life. It just depends on the, on the quantum, you know, how much on the dosage, how much it is. Right. And then I come in also with the belief systems. You know, we have that fear is very much tied to belief sentences, to belief system. Uh, so if you think that something, or if you're convinced, it's not about thinking, it's about being convinced deep down that this is very dangerous, this is life-threatening, there you really have to have a look on it because belief sentences can enhance and they can completely um, make us stop, stop everything, paralyze. Right, right. So the, the simple... Uh, I had not put together that the fear and the belief systems, but it makes perfect sense because the other way of interpreting that at my end is learned behavior, right? That you're learning these fears from other people. And so this is a non-leadership example, but a simple one. My mother was afraid of heights. Therefore, my brother was afraid of heights. Therefore, I'm afraid of heights. Right. And I have been working very hard not to to overcome that fear because it it's not logical and uh, so the example we use for everybody out there before was one of the ways i did that was to go skydiving and carola said there's no way that she would ever go skydiving but that was part of dealing with that fear of heights but so i chose to deal with that head on but most of us it's not that significant it's much more subtle that are emotionally charged exchanges and things that happen at work and with personal relationships so how do i give myself credit for that intuition that i have um you're telling me that i have this this gut feel and intuition but how do i know that how how do we help people with that what I do is actually I play with them. Okay. I mean, there, there comes my background with of actressing because you would call it a, a paradox intervention. Okay. Because one thing is if it's if it's like you said a learned behavior, if it's belief sentence, the fear is so big and so untangible that it's very very hard to tackle it. You just ha you you have to learn a little bit before that this is a 
this is a fear that can disappear very easily just by giving back or family constellation work and so on. So what I do there is I play with them that we kind of improvise a story together, that we use theater improvisation, imagining that we are on stage, so 100 people watching at least. And believe me, their dignity, humiliation, and so on is a big risk. If you fail there, it feels awful. And there's very few role, rules, you know. I, I start, I give, I give in I know, one or two sentences, and the other person or all the others there have to also maximum two sentences to add on. And they have to listen. They have to imagine the picture that's being built up and adding to the picture. So the audience does not realize that you don't know where it's going to. And after two rounds or something, then we have to find an end. Mm -hmm. So you really have to develop that. And it's, it sounds so challenging and it's so natural to do it. And you just do that with another person. So you're going back and forth of back two and forth. sentences, two sentences, two sentences, creating the story. And at some point you must raise a flag to say, we need to get to a conclusion. Don't raise the flag. Ah, okay. We just have like, I, you know, it depends how many people are there, but if it's two, we say about, okay, 20 going back and forth. We count with that. So we, we know at 15, we have to look for a conclusion, you know? Okay. Um, and this, and the wonderful thing is, it's very challenging because we really, and this is the answer actually to what you said, we have to develop for the intuition, we have to develop the listening, the listening and the imagination and the emotions going along with, mm -hmm. and this is what happens with the story game, because you always are, you, you plan, of course you, we plan in advance, we are, we are raised like that. But if the other person puts in an intervention that is new, you have to completely change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's best to not plan in advance, but to really go for that, take the time. Mm. It's not a fast game. And if you really are stuck, you have to say, okay, I pass on to you now. That's possible. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful, just an example. Because you really, you learn to listen, to digest emotionally. And then all of a sudden you get the next step. It comes up naturally. We just built like that. Mm -hmm. But we need to experience that it is like that. So do you use this play game? The example that you just gave was in a team or a group environment. Do you use this on a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship as well on building the story? Both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in theory, if we wanted to, if as we're doing our own self-awareness and self-reflection, we could play this game with ourselves as a way to process how does this story develop? And yeah. what are yeah. what are the turns and exits that we would yeah. make on that? Okay. Okay. I would even ask, I mean, you know, I, I work with a, with a thing that I call the inner coach. Yeah. So if you go in a kind of meditation and just in the alpha state, and then you get a second being with you that wants just the best for you. It's your best friend, it's your inner wisdom, your inner coach, however you call it. And with this second person, you can do that wonderfully. And this, especially if you have a question, you know, if you develop a, re a solution or something, if you, if you need to make big decisions, get this coach in. Right. And in advance train with the coach so you know yeah. you're confident with each other because for this open creativity you need, you, you, you apply here, you need a safe space, a, a psychologically safe space. Yeah. And still there can come in some fear because sometimes the inner coach offers something well, you know, he's so right or she's so right. Yeah. But um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like in psychology where they have the, uh, uh, the system of the empty chair, having a discussion of that other person in the empty chair. And right. what would that person say? So I really like, I, I like that story that I can use that inner coach anytime to say, 
what the one who has my best intentions in mind, what would they do and say? Yeah. Um, it also takes me along the path a little bit of if we don't have that trust and confidence that you mentioned earlier, that maybe I take an inventory to give myself credit of what I do know and the good decisions I've made. So what I mean specifically about this, if I'm not trusting my, my gut and intuition, maybe I need to go back, go back or from a coaching perspective, we rarely go back, we go forward. So maybe we say, why don't you start keeping track of when you have trusted your gut and it worked out well, and even if it didn't work out well, do, do you suggest that sometime with your clients to have some journaling with that? Yeah, yeah, of course, because that's what it is. You need to, we are rational beings as well. You know, intuition is one thing, but of course we have, we have, we have a rational mind and this rational mind is, for me, it's like the, like the, the one at the steering wheel on a ship, you know? Yeah. My intuition, my wisdom, and so on. This is my captain. And the one is at the steering wheel. And in our, in our society, we sometimes tend to give the steering wheel person all the, all the credit. And this is, this is asking for too much. But of course, if you work together well, you have you have a track of that and you you know already okay i'm quite good at this in the end mm. mm -hmm. so we have to develop the captain of the ship and trust <laughs> the captain of the ship but know that we work hand in hand yeah yes for the for the true navigation yeah that's good well, your book is Being Boldly Human, and um, you talk about fear and courage. What are those other thoughts you have that we have to, to move that courage aside, sorry, move the fear aside and build the courage? Any final thoughts that you have in, in, that, in that subject? Well, you know, the, the book talks about daring to think differently which also implies daring to lead differently. And um, if you apply that, the courage, the trust, the confidence, as a culture of leading, as a culture within your organization, you develop something or you establish something that I call this daring to think differently. Because I truly believe the more we go into a digital transformation, the more we humans have the tendency to try to become like a computer. And this is definitely not our strength because the computer just processes data very sequentially, one after the other, zero, one, zero, one. And also the conclusions a computer makes out of this data are based on this sequential thinking. And we can do that but only to limited times. We can do sequential thinking best when we are in threat of dying. Then we do that usually, if we are good survivors. If we're bad survivors, we don't do it at all. But if you're good survivors, we do one step, one step, one step, one step, one step. Humans originally are not one step after the other beings. We are complex, we are ambivalent. We have moods, we have emotions. And if we then combine both, because we all know one step after the other is a very wise thing to do. Still, if we force ourselves to always do one step after the other, we will never exit our fears. It does not work. Because we feel and all of a sudden we know. And it's kind of a, a jumpstart development. And then you have to work on it so you can, you can, you can have a solid grounded experience of it. But the development is usually not slow. It's a jumping development. And there, I think it's so important to develop that, you know, to have this concept of courage, trust, and confidence. To be, to know that we are, the more freedom digital transformation gives us, because we don't have to go on this path, 
the more we should or can also develop our potential, which mm. is a lot about creativity, about humor, about one thing there also, how to deal with conflict, you know, take mm. the danger out of conflict. Mm -hmm. because then it's an inspiration because then it's two approaches to the same topic wonderful right. for innovation development it's perfect right so the, this is where I, where I go to the final thing is just let's develop us human beings so we can work together well with computers use them apply what they are just better and then introduce our our high 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 potential that's wonderful, you know, and especially with the pandemic, this works out greatly. And females, yeah, <laughs> we're just good at that. Yeah, we, women have that tendency naturally, based on their physiology, and also from learned behavior, um, mm -hmm. even with uh, younger generations as well. Um, and what that came to mind with the computer is the computer is very black and white that zero one zero one you know so we're looking if we want that linear black and white answer or solution that's one yeah. thing but we now we know not now but we know with humans we live in a very fluctuating gray world of, of gradations of the black and white and so i'm glad you brought up that non-linear is associated with complexity complex relationships complex problem solving and what comes of that being comfortable in that environment comes innovation comes tremendous creativity which are non-linear functions so i appreciate you making those connections along the way um, i think i'd i'd be inclined to wrap up by saying progressive leadership meaning moving away from so much structure, moving away from command and control, moving away from an autocratic environment yeah. does lead us to courage and trust and confidence and intuition, yeah. adding that, that fourth one that you alluded to, which puts us in an environment also of being quite vulnerable and transparent and telling stories to build that mutual trust as well. So yeah. um, is that is there more to the message that you would like to add of how you ask leaders to be bolder and to to dare to think differently? I, I really, I challenge them to try it out. That's what I do. And this is what I, what I would also kind of convey as a message. Try, just do it and start with yourself. When you do it, start listening to yourself, start liking yourself. I mean, the fourth word I put in is now you, you have actually, it's, it's wonderful what you did. Um, courage, confidence, trust, and um, what did you say? I added intuition. Intuition. And what I put as a fifth word is love. It's, it's, you know, you can sum it all up by loving what you're doing, loving yourself, loving your people, loving what you're doing. And it's not meant in the erotic way, just in this basic believing that your employees are good. They have a good intention that you chose you chose as a leader, you chose the best people. So make them give their best and encourage them to do that. And this works with a, a very loving approach. And loving means also that you believe in success, like unconditionally, you know, mm -hmm. like a parent that you would never, you would never doubt that your child learns to run, learns to walk. You don't doubt it. You encourage it you know and this is a little bit what what got lost i would say it's not that it never was there it just got lost with too much speed and we're not so quick right and and i think that the the child analogy is a good one because we're reminded to take a step back and we don't go from crawling to running <laughs> we go right. moving our body to crawling to standing up to 
taking a step while holding on and so forth. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, yeah. uh, I think there's a lot of things that are very enlightening about our discussion today. And Carola Sikotnik is, is sharing her expertise from Austria and her work of, of being bold and uh, really using those five words now we're going to say of love, courage, trust, confidence, and intuition. All of those things will help us be, you know, more boldly human and therefore more providing bold leadership as well. So right. thank you, Carola, for so much for investing time with me today. And we will see you on the next Coach to Coach. Looking forward to. Thanks. <laughs>